Jackie McCormick, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, boy, life has been a whirlwind for you uh, lately. Uh, got a feature film in the works, but you also you're you're still busy with what you're doing with Rise Above. Let, let's step back and tell us about what Rise Above is all about. Yeah, so Rise Above, um, we're in year eight of Rise Above. We're a 501c3, but the mission of Rise Above is educating, empowering kids through sport. And I constantly get asked, like, why sport? Um, really, sp sport and basketball in particular really gave me um, an opportunity and a vehicle to to get to places I never dreamed that I could be. And um, got me an education, played basketball at Illinois State. But more importantly, I think as an 18-year-old kid or 19-year-old kid on the campus of normal Illinois, you know, 3,000 miles away from home, it was a moment of clarity for me of if I can do it, if I can grow up in Lapway, a town of a thousand people and make it to Bloomington normal to play for Illinois State University. I want to make sure that other kids know that they can do it and it's possible. So that dream as an 18, 19 year old kid turned into, you know, year eight, going on year eight for Rise Above, serving, you know, over 3000 kids a year and all about prevention and education, but using sport as a modality. Let's, let's face it. People don't understand or even are even curious about native culture. I mean, that's just a fact. Uh -huh. uh, and I think it surprises a lot of people that basketball plays such a large role in native communities. Can you talk about that and explain what that's all about so people can understand? Yeah, well, actually, I just had, um, I met up with Coffee. I'm in Denver and I met up with um, Coach George Carl, who was recently inducted in the Hall of Fame. And he asked the same question, why, like, why basketball, right? Um, and I talk about this with a lot of people, a lot of my friends, colleagues. And the only thing that, you know, for me, for basketball is it doesn't take a team. It doesn't take equipment. It doesn't take the cost. The barrier is low for people to be able to pick up a basketball. And I think for a lot of natives, basketball was just a, a safe spot, a safe sp spot to get away. And it was easy access. You just needed a ball and a rim. You didn't need a team, the equipment, um, you know, like the other sports. And I, I don't know what, why or how amazing basketball players come from reservations and the talent. I mean, you we, we have camps sometimes and you have little five-year-old kids dribbling the basketball around the camp. And it's, it's an incredible sight to see. Um, but I don't know. It's 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 just a wild thing. And it's for me, it's become a part of our culture and who we are. And it's it, it, we identify with sport and basketball in particular. And when you go to a basketball game, for example, in my hometown in Lapway, the gym is packed, you know, go to a state tournament, you know, five hours away and they the community, the family, friends travel with you. So it's like a home game, even when you're in a state tournament. I, I grew up on the Yakima Reservation and. I know what that is all about in like the tournaments that they would have, like at our high school in Wapato and the place would be jammed for the days that they were having it. And the basketball that I used to see played was talk about wide open and just tremendous offensive basketball. You know, they, these guys could shoot for, I mean, they were shooting three pointers, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, you know, of course, that wasn't counting as a three point, but the, the ranges that, that most of the players had, it was is very incredible to watch. So how did basketball, where did, when did it start for you? Well, I've been dribbling a basketball ever since I can remember. I think, um, you know, in that, that tournament that you're talking about, Wapato High School, right? And my dad actually coached teams. So I went to that tournament every year as a youngster. Every year as a kid, I went and I supported my dad and his team. We would go over there and I would watch these these guys, incredible athletes playing. But I've been dribbling a basketball. I fell in love with basketball at an early age. And I think that's all part of my journey is, you know, I was raised by my grandparents and just fell in love with sports, fell in love with the competition. And I remember watching a basketball game at Wapato High School. And it was the first time I ever saw someone dribble between their legs in a game. <laughs> I was so like, 
I was obsessed. I saw it and I was like, what just happened? Like he had it and I, I just was obsessed. And so I went back home and I was like, somebody needs to teach me this move. Like there's this guy. And I, I just remember that so vividly. And it was at that tournament in particular at Wapato High School. And I, it, those are just such great memories. And, you know, for me, sport was sport was therapeutic for me. Um, you know, my transition from Lapway to Lake Oswego, that was where I found peace, um, was basketball. And anytime stress, anxiety, it was, you grab a ball and you go shoot. Yeah. yeah. Lake Oswego. I'm from Portland. So I'm very familiar with that. That's gotta be a culture shock because that is a white privileged kind of town. You know, that's just a suburb of Portland. How did you fit in? Well, the short answer is I didn't. <laughs> the, the long answer is, you know, it was a culture shock. And I think in every aspect of my life, whether it was education, friends, school, home environment. I mean, I was taking public transportation to Lake Oswego High School and you had kids driving in with BMWs and, you know, all these nice cars, luxury cars. And I was taking public transportation or my uncle would drop me off in his minivan because he had two boys and they were coaching parents. Um, but it was a culture shock. It was very hard for me to adjust. Um, not just being away from my family. Cause I moved and I stayed with my aunt, uncle and their two boys. It was so hard academically. I was challenged. I was athletically, I was challenged, um, finding friends. Fortunately through sport, you know, you kind of have a built-in friendship through your basketball team, but it was so hard. And the, the thing I love about that experience is had I not gone through that, I don't know that I would have made it in college and been able to fight the homesickness, the adversity you experience in college, um, you know, going into a college environment and not being like the person and um, all those things, not getting the playing time, being away from home and college is hard. I don't know that I would have survived without my experience at Lake Oswego. So I'm so thankful. My coach was great. I think that's was probably one of the key moments for me is my, my head coach. He was amazing. And I had an English teacher that I really relied on. I was like, I had to ask for help. That's where I learned to ask for help. Um, and it was really hard, you know, as, as kids, as adults, asking for help is never easy. And that was my moment where I understood that I needed other people to help me get through this process. There is a backstory into how you got to Portland in that, okay, you grew up on the Nez Perce Reservation, uh, Lapway, uh, Idaho. And so growing up there, uh, what was that life like? Growing up on the reservation is an experience that I, I think everyone needs to experience. I think when you go and you grow up in a small town, a small community like that, um, it's it's amazing. You see all the people, um, family, friends, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the movies, when you like, it's always a community environment. And I think that's what makes it sometimes so hard for our young people to leave the reservation is because it's such a tight knit community where you go to basketball games, you go, you know, you do all these things and you're always around familiar faces or somebody, you know, and it's so embracing. And so when you leave that environment and you're now surrounded in college by a lot of people that don't look like you don't understand where you come from. It's hard to fight through that when you come from such a tight knit community. Um, I think the one biggest challenge growing up in a small town, uh, you know, to be quite honest is everybody knows everything, you know, it's small town and, mm. you know, good, bad, indifferent, everybody knows everything. And that's one of the challenges is really making sure that you're expanding and trying to get out of that, um, that mindset of that's, that's a bubble and you need to like get break out of that bubble. And I was fortunate, you know, my parents traveled all over the country playing sports, um, whether they were playing or coaching. And I got to experience a lot of that. So I was very fortunate in, in my upbringing. Yeah. You had a particular incident that happened to you as a young person that uh, again, suddenly you faced this adversity where uh, can you talk about that and, and how that ended up uh, really opening the door for you to have to leave the community and go to Portland? 
Yeah. You know, every time I think about this, it, it, it changes my, you know, my perspective and what I thought about as a kid versus as an adult. And in hindsight, you know, when I think about this um, incident, so what, what essentially happened is kids were involved in, um, uh, you know, this kid ended up losing his life over this altercation that happened. And I, it was wearing on me because I knew who did it. I knew who was involved and it could have been me. I like, it was young kids, right? And I could have been a part of that, but I knew who did it and it was weighing on my heart. And I just remember like going through those emotions and saying like, I know who did this. And it was, you know, it was a big deal in my community and it really shook my community and divided the community in my opinion. And, you know, again, I always talk from my own experiences, but coming forward was very hard. It was very hard to come forward not only just to my parents, but just in general, it was, you know, choosing what was right, despite everything that was going on around you. And when I think about that as a 14 year old kid or 15 year old kid, I just, I, I don't know the emotion of that. Like, I can't even like, when I think back about it now, as I'm mentoring kids, I look at 15 year old kids and say, wow, that was me in that moment that that's my age and that's my maturity level. Um, And when I did come forward, it was very hard. Uh, My friends, you know, were divided. Some people really shunned me. Some people in my community shunned me and it it was very hard. And this came after winning a state championship, going undefeated my sophomore year. I was on track to be the first first female to win Idaho player of the year for four years. Cause I got it as a freshman. I got it as a sophomore. We were undefeated. We had all of our returning players coming back for our junior year. So me leaving was more than just me leaving as a kid. It was leaving this basketball tradition and these records and, you know, all of these things what that could have been, could have been, should have been, would have been right. Um, and it was very hard. I think, when I'm in it, like us, we go and we talk about not only just the culture shock, but being away from my mom. So my mom is my grandma. And I never understood the importance of just seeing her after school. So she was retired when I started my freshman year of high school. So when I came home for the day, I saw her every day. And I never knew what impact that had on me until I moved to Lake Oswego. And, you know, my aunt and uncle, both working parents, always gone, two young kids. And so I was home alone and I would come home and it it was an empty house. And I was like, I never understood that emotion until later on. I never understood the importance of just seeing my mom. We didn't even have to talk, but just seeing her and her being there was so important for me. Right. Yeah. It's that sense of security that you have. Yeah. So, so you, you know, you achieved great success in college and, and then when you graduated, what were your choices at that time? What did you decide to do? You know, I remember sitting in my coach's office and she was asking me about, do you want to play professionally? Do you want to do um, a, be a grad assistant? What, like, what do you want to do? And at that moment, I had left my home as a 15-year-old kid. So I had been gone for, I graduated when I was 23, redshirted a year. So I had been gone at that point almost eight years. And I didn't really have, uh, again, I didn't really have a mentor that went on to play professionally that could kind of guide and direct me. Like, you really should go play somewhere, right? I was so passionate about basketball, but I was like, I need to be home. I need to go home and see my family. My mom misses me. My dad misses me. My family misses me. And so I turned down a lot of opportunity to be home with my family. And I think that goes back to, you know, being raised in that tight knit community where all of your family and friends are there. And my dad had a very extended family and a lot of siblings. And so I have a lot of like cousins and first and third. And so I went home. Um, in hindsight, I wish I would have went and played, um, my senior year after I graduated, one of the um, teams that we were in conversation with was a team in Israel. And I remember choosing between like growing up and getting a job and going to play professional basketball in Israel. And I remember that distinctly because it was a moment where you choose a path, right. And it's going to lead you somewhere. 
and I chose work. I went to work for Portland Area Indian Health Board. And we always talk about how I wish what what path you could have led led you down a certain way. But when I think about the experience and where it led me to meeting Brad, to meeting all these incredible folks, like, you know, you all rise above is bigger than me. It's bigger than my story. And I think it's for a serious purpose. And so I try not to think about what if I went and played college or professional basketball, Uh, I would have loved that experience. I encourage all the young athletes now, but I think my journey is much bigger than you know, who I am. I think Rise Above is very purposeful and it's intentional. And I think it happened for a reason. Yeah. It's part of your journey too. Um, You had another obstacle when you went to Illinois State. I find it interesting that the town was called Normal. Uh, (laughs) Because really you went through some abnormal things here. But uh, again, like you you went to Portland, you had that test of adversity uh, there and just trying to, to, to fit in. And you went to your coach and basically said, I think I want to leave. And your coach said some stuff that probably you didn't expect her to say. (laughs) Yeah. Honestly, I don't even know if she remembers saying it, but it was so, you know, it's one of those memories that you just, it just sticks with you. And, you know, I quit probably a thousand times. And I remember going into her office and I was like, you know, what, this is it. I'm done. Like, I can't do this anymore. I miss my home. I miss my parents. I miss my family. And she, you know, she said to me, she was like, okay, go ahead and quit. Go back home, go to the res and be another statistic about somebody who should have made it, but didn't. I was angry. I was so angry. I was like, can't say that everything inside of me was boiling. And I was like, you cannot say that to me, but she was right. I was like, I had to push through. And it was that moment where I was like, this is it. I got to do this. Like, I'm not going to be another statistic because I think there is a lot of talent and taking advantage of those opportunities um, is important, not only for me as a person, but for the future, right? Future kids that come through and say, Jackie did it or so-and-so did it. I could do it. And you got a degree, right? Yep. I, uh, I, I actually, I wanted to do, um, I was really interested in science and um, I, I worked all my internships in the fisheries program. Fisheries is a big deal. All of our natural resources are a big deal for my tribe. So I did all my internships at the fisheries program. When I went to college, it just, as an athlete, they, you know, they control your schedule. So my labs did not align with my basketball schedule. Mm. So I did major until... I think I was a junior or senior and I chose sociology and I chose that because I was so interested in why we do the things we do. And uh, so it was great. I, I mean, I wouldn't, it wasn't my first choice. I guess my, my point is that when you're a college athlete, you sacrifice a lot. And that was one of the things that I had to sacrifice because it didn't align. And I was a freshman and, you know, they cater more to the juniors and seniors who already have, their majors chosen. Um, and you had to, your schedule had to align with the practice schedule. Yeah. You know, the, what your coach said to you about being a statistic. Um, that's so true, right? I mean, there's so much underdeveloped talent on reservations and, you know, we, we, we've done a number, we've done a number of programs about this, you know, about, uh, young women that are, are whatever happens to them and they disappear and no one cares. Do you think part of the work of your foundation and, and how it rolls into this movie is a lot to address that? Because people don't know anything about Native culture. And, and I think they choose not to because it's really painful. Yeah, I mean, so much talent. I mean, you see uh, there is so much talent. I think that is definitely one of the things we want to create exposure and opportunities and really be a pipeline for kids, right, to take advantage of those opportunities and grow in that way. But I I think it is hard when you think back about the history of America and we don't, you know, you guys know it, we don't teach accurate history in our, you know, so it is, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to address. It's hard to think back about what maybe um, the realities of what happened and and how that really transitioned to who we are as a community today. Right. Um, but 
what I love about Rise Above and the partnerships that we've got is the support has been across the board. It's not just tribal leaders. It's not just tribal organizations. You know, we're working with the city of Seattle. Mayor Harrell has been awesome. Um, Council President Juarez has been unbelievable support person for us, but we're expanding. We're in conversation um, about expanding to a really a, a massive um, organization in Seattle about being a prevention arm of their work and an outreach arm. And I think the more we can elevate the work of Rise Above, the more awareness we can bring to, to others. And, you know, I always say a rising tide lifts all ships. And it's not about just making Rise Above sustainable and successful. It's making everybody sustainable and successful. And I think that's where we're headed. I, I'm excited about the future of Rise Above for that reason, creating awareness and the importance of investing back into these tribal communities and tribal kids. Yeah. How did Rise Above start? Well, um, it's an interesting start. <laughs> I actually moved to Seattle. Brad, uh, I met Brad. He was working at the Healing Lodge and I was working at, at my and, tribe. And, and, and Brad, by the way, is Brad Meyer, right? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brad yeah. Meyer, founder. So I met him, uh, you know, working separate and we're both doing prevention um, outreach and I needed change in my personal life. I was going through a lot personally. And he said, hey, I'm working for this nonprofit over in Seattle. You should come over. And, you know, I think it would be great. So the concept of Rise Above was really supposed to be under this separate um, nonprofit that I was coming over to work for. Well, I, fortunately or unfortunately, that nonprofit fell through, but it really forced Brad and I to say, OK, we still want to do this. We still want to figure this out. And that's how really how Rise Above was born is this other nonprofit fell through and we had to figure out how to start Rise Above um, under that. So it, it was a blessing in disguise at the time. I'm like, you got me to Seattle and now this nonprofit is like non-existent. Um, but it was another moment of, you know, you pick your path, like you pick your path on where you go. And um, that's how Rise Above was formed is the failure of another nonprofit. Yeah. So how does this all roll up into a feature film <laughs> about, about you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if you know Brad, you know that he is a master connector. Um, he has the ability to really bring people together to support the mission of Rise Above. Um, so in true Brad fashion, he was talking to somebody else on another nonprofit and he said his name is Dennis Lee and he's, um, you know, a successful producer in Hollywood. And he said, hey, what do you do outside of this, Brad? And Brad was like, oh, well, I founded a nonprofit. You know, we work with Native youth and basketball. And he goes, oh, I always wanted to do a movie about res ball. Because that's what they call Native mm -hmm. run and gun, res ball. And so we got on the phone. I got some tribal leaders on the phone. Like, hey, this guy wants to make a film. Don't really know what it's about. Don't, don't have any idea. Got a bunch of people on the phone. And Dennis, we, we talked. And he goes, yeah, well, I want to do the movie. But I think... I want to do it about your life story. And I was like, my life story. Um, it, so the idea came to us outside of this work. Right. Um, but I think when I talked to Dennis, when I talked to Brad about what this film can provide, it was really hard for me to weigh whether I should do this. Cause if you know me, I'm, I'm very introverted. I, my trust is very small. I, I always laugh because uh, the movie um, Meet the Parents, the circle of trust. I always like laugh about that. <laughs> small. Um, but thinking about like, you know, really exposing who you are and your life story, the good, the bad, all of it um, for the world to see is a little overwhelming. But when I when I process it and I think about if it can impact one kid and one family of what I went through and what my journey is, then it's worth it. So really, the idea of this, you know, trying to create a social movement for our kids and our communities and our families. And I would argue, you know, all kids. Um, but to have a platform to be able to be in a mainstream media a feature film, it's not a it's about me, but it's not about me. It's about creating a place where kids can see somebody like them 
in film. I mean, I bet you both have experiences that, uh, you know, growing up and seeing this and um, how important that is for you and your own journeys. And that's what we want is we want to, you know, really create those spaces for our kids and um, yeah, give them an opportunity, but also give us another platform to be able to impact more kids and involve them as much as we can in the process. Yeah. I mean, you it's can, important to have kids see films that reflect their, their lives and, yeah. and see people who they're around. I mean, and that look like them. That look like them. Yeah. 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 The interesting thing to me is that you've gotten some uh, big names that have really stepped up to support this project, but also rise above Lenny Wilkins, you know, the guy that is, uh, you know, he brought the world championship to Seattle back in 1979 as head coach of the Supersonics. What is he? Uh, Three time Hall of Famer. Uh, Gary Payton, uh, who's also supporting you. Danny Glover. I think it goes back, though, to really finding people and organizations who truly believe in the mission and are like minded and like visioned. And it's so important. And we've been so blessed most of our connections have really come organically through work and outreach. And I would say that I would argue that every partner that we have had has come through service to others in some capacity. And that's how we've that's how we've been today. And when you, if you would have told me, you know, 10 years ago that you're going to be mentored by Lenny Wilkins and he's going to be, you know, one of your biggest supporters for a nonprofit, like I wouldn't have believed you. But to sit and have Lenny Wilkins be your mentor, it's it's truly humbling. Um, and he's just been a such great support. So it's been really fun to bring, you know, these people that have reached a, a level of success that not a lot of people reach and they're coming out to tribal communities to work with kids and they're invested. Um, it's just an amazing feeling. I think, you know, for, we have Carla McGee who does a tremendous job. She was on the 96 women's Olympic team, won a gold medal for team USA. And she's doing assemblies at, you know, Lakeside high school, middle school in Plummer, Plummer, Idaho with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. But these communities are remote communities. So it takes us a minute to get there, you know, mm -hmm. flying from into Seattle to Spokane then driving two hours to, to different tribal communities. Um, so it's incredible that they're invested to take that much time to come in, in to our communities and, and really be invested in what we're doing and um, moving our mission forward. Where are you with the film? Where, what's the status of it now? We have a shoot date for July 31st of this year. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. I don't know a lot about the process of it. So uh, we always we always joke um, about staying in our lanes. So um, my lane is the story and what it's about. Um, but we're excited. July 31st, firming up um, shooting, like physical shooting details. Um, there's a lot of as you guys know, incentives to film in certain states and some are better than others. Um, that's way above my pay grade, but <laughs> we're excited to be able to um, have a shoot day and I'm just excited to involve the kids and community. I think it's going to be a powerful, powerful project from start to finish. Are, um, are, you, are you in it? Is this like your story being told with actors and or is it more documentary style features? I, I'm not in it, um, but I, I say this often when we talk about the film is, you know, I, I thought about this young girl often and I don't know who she is and I don't know where she's going to come from. The one that's going to play my role in the film. And I think about her often because this is a platform that could, you know, really change her life and give her a platform to be able to impact others. And so I'm excited to meet this girl. I don't know who she is, but I think about her often and the platform and what she's going to be able to do, not only for herself, but for others and community members. It's it's really it's really exciting. It gives me like chills thinking about <laughs> this, this young girl and and what she's going to be able to do. It's it's super exciting. Well, you could always do a walk on, right? A cameo, be the me graph that was in your life. That just... <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. And well, having Wilkins, like figuring out where him and Danny Glover are going to be the cameos in the. Yeah. Uh, so before we wrap up, I, I want to ask again uh, more about just 
what basketball means to native culture, because so much of the culture has been torn away, just, you know, internal, but, you know, just what the U S has done. Um, does basketball, basket, because basketball is much deeper than like inner city youth, right? Basketball is where they grow up and stuff. But it seems to me there's much more of a spiritual and familial connection with res ball. Can you speak about that? I mean, why is it such a huge deal? What is it replacing that was missing? I, I think now it is. It is our culture. It is part of our culture. Um, I, I don't know, but I, you know, when we talked about the film and, and what it, you know, the ending of the film and, I told Dennis, I was like, I'm going to go to the state tournament and I'm going to watch and I'm going to observe everything. I'm just going to be in the moment observing all of it. Right. And when I went to the state tournament last year, I watched the girls and I had a niece on the team. They won state and they, they played against this rivalry team. And as I was watching, it was, it was pride. It was, you know, these, we, the community carried themselves. They were so passionate about the game. But for me, when I watched it and I'm taking it from a different lens, it's way more than basketball, right? It's way more than winning this game. It's, it's deep. It's, um, I, I, I don't know. I can't explain, but in those moments, I was like, this is way bigger than basketball. It's, it's taking something back. It's, you know, it's, it's that reclaiming of, um, almost your identity. Um, but it was a powerful moment. I think, you know, you have anywhere from babies and baby boards going down to the state tournament to great, great grandmas that are there in the stands watching the games. And it's, it, it's so beautiful. Um, but I would say that it is definitely a part of our culture and who we are now. Um, and you go to any reservation. I wanted to do this project to go to reservations and take pictures of all the hoops. We call them res hoops. And they could be like missing backboards, um, nets that aren't there, right? Or nice, full, functional basketball hoops. Um, but every reservation you go to, I guarantee there's multiple basketball courts and basketballs all around the reservation. And it's so powerful, but I think it's it's therapeutic and it's cultural. Um, and I, it like, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but... I wish everybody would come experience it one time. Um, it, it, it belongs to your community, I think, and, and it is yours. And you're right. I think for indigenous people in this country, especially that are all too often ignored and that it's the one thing that you can hold on to and say, it's ours. It belongs to me, my family, my community. And, and I think that's something that, the you know, you have to you have to go and watch these things because these tournaments <laughs> are just incredible in the vibe, and you can find fried bread there too. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the other you know, with a community, um, I know we're trying to wrap up, but post uh, Title Nine, well, they just actually celebrated this team. They were the the first state championship team came from Lapway, Idaho, and my biological mother was the first Idaho State Player of the Year post title nine. And I think about like just those moments in history, right. And how powerful that was. And each year, this little town of Lapway, you know, a thousand people creates such talented athletes and like how, like, how does, I don't, I, I can't explain how that works. And it's true for a lot of tribal communities. Um, but it's special for sure. You, you, you got to experience, um, a, a native basketball tournament absolutely right, right. one other thing i wanted to ask you about is that i know that you're trying to get some brick and mortar created as well right uh where are you with that is as far as having a, a particular place where you have a center and and uh the kids can come to yeah we you know we we started the conversation with a tribe in eastern washington and i i think that the concept of the Rise Above Centers is going to be really powerful when we get um, the brick and mortar in place, whether that's on the reservation or off, but it gives kids a safe spot to go to, but it also incorporates all the other elements, um, incorporating science and technology, incorporating classrooms, healthy eating. So it's a holistic approach, but at the end of the day, it's a safe spot for our kids. And I think once we have those in place, 
um, my, my, my ultimate dream for Rise Above is really to be a national program and have these Rise Above centers all across the country and have Rise Above employees, you know, in those positions where kids can seek out help and services um, and guidance. The other thing that, you know, I've been talking about is creating a Rise Above school. Um, you know, we talk about high school graduation rates for Native yeah. American numbers uh, really have not increased like they should. So having a, a high school where kids can go to where the 100% graduation rate and 100% of kids go to college, that's how you change the narrative for our kids. That's how you change a culture. That's how you change a generation. And that's what's exciting is talking about those bigger picture things, brick and mortar, schools, scholarships. Um, it's exciting. I think we have a lot of a lot of work ahead of us, but um, you got to love it for sure. All right. Jackie McCormick, thank you so much for taking the time. And, uh, you know, when the film comes out, I want you to come back and talk about uh, that whole process of doing this. And do you get out and hoop daily or how often? I I play a little bit. Um, yeah, <laughs> my mind my mind goes a lot faster than my body. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I understand that. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us, and and yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, and good luck with the film, and um, really admire what you're doing for your community. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I I admire the two of you. I Brad talks rave reviews about the both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Brad's a good man. All right, thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you.